but yeah. Um, all right, so talk to me, please. Beatrice, uh, what is FDR's grand plan? So, does he even have a plan? No, he's like, we're going to try a bunch of stuff. And if that doesn't work, we're going to try more stuff. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, we try more stuff. we're going to try more stuff. Uh, but at least he's doing what? Something. Trying something, right? Beats the hell out of the FDR, the Hoover approach. <laughs> that really sucks, man. It must really suck to be poor in America. I'm going to send the army, actually, because you can't be here. Go be poor somewhere else, please. I beat it. This idea, though, that, that true leadership calls for the setting forth of the objectives and rallying public opinion and supporting objectives. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to try something and we're going to do our best in it. So turn your page. It's a really good cartoon for you. Uh, with your partner, take a minute. Uh, what is this cartoon trying to get at? What is the purpose and perspective of this cartoon? What New Deal struggle or Great Depression, excuse me, struggle does this cartoon represent? Take a minute to talk to your partner. Dive in. Uh, what am I trying to get at with this cartoon? Go for it. I find it very sarcastic how the score like to save stuff for like winter. Why did he not do the same? However, five seconds. It didn't work because banks go. Boom. All right. Does that mean trees fail? So, if you could please uh, talk to me. <laughs> Sounds like a girl. Are you so Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't do that. Elliot, talk to me. Uh, what situation is this cartoon depicting and why? Okay, okay. Uh, reasonable. Luis, build off that. Um, basically saying that uh, he has no uh, role to go. Uh, he established um, uh, money to the banks. Uh, still, uh, the banks uh, weren't uh, necessarily uh, attributed. Uh, like, he wanted something to say, and I called him, and now he's doing this. No, no, I really do. I really do. So he's basically saying that even though the banks uh, had money in them, uh, the money wasn't going to everyone, so it's like not everyone was deposit money. Okay. The squirrels say, "Why didn't you save money like I do for winter?" Sure. That's what squirrels do, right? They say they save up, they, they they store it up for the winter. Talk to me. It's just kind of ironic because the squirrels saying you should have saved, and this man did, but like yeah. the bank failed. So exactly. I went to get my money, but there was no money. He did his part, and so much of society is like, why are all these people poor? They should have saved money when they when things were so good in the twenties, and they're like, we did save money. Nine million people's savings accounts were wiped out. So from a con contextual standpoint, we can assume this is probably before FDR takes office, before the bank holiday, before we restore confidence in banking, um, at, at the very outset of FDR's presidency. Now, uh, fun fact, uh, when it rains, it pours. You heard that expression? So when things are bad, they tend to get even worse. Uh, in the middle of the Great Depression, the world, our country's worst financial crisis ever, we also, of course, undertake our worst environmental crisis ever as well at the same time. Because when it rains, it pours, except on the Dust Bowl, in which case some rain would have been helpful. <laughs> now, um, what we see beginning in 1930 and carrying through for the next six years is this. What we see is, is a huge drought dry out the entire middle of the country, followed by massive windstorms, which then takes that dry dirt and dust and spreads it all over the rest of the country. We see a dust cloud, a dirt and sand cloud, stretching from the Gulf of Mexico into Canada. That, I can't explain to you guys how, what a big deal this is. And of course, it's happening right in the middle of the Great Depression. 
Now this dust bowl is caused by overgrazing. We have too many cows eating grass uh, and too many sheep eating grass and then the grass is not being replenished fast enough. Over farming, as our advanced industrial farm techniques allow us to farm more, pull water from farther away, pull water from deeper in the ground, overproduction of farming. So when everything is turned into a nice, really fine dust, a huge drought happens, which dries it out even further. It's, yeah, that sucks. We're all, and you can't fix this. You take a hose out there? <laughs> right, we're talking about the entire middle part, the Midwest of the United States. And uh, where are all these people going to go then? Cities. Cities, well, there's no more frontier. This, is the, this was the last one. These people already go to cities, and how are things in the cities at this time? Terrible. Also terrible. What is the big long term cause of this Dust Bowl, though? What's the biggest long term cause? Tornadoes. Industrialization, sure, that's part of it. The industrialization of farming, sure. What else? Corn. It was an act. I don't know if it was Keep going, because you're right. Oh. We're like, it was, it was the, land, the Homestead Act. Oh. Christoph, with the wind today, check that out. The Homestead Act, think about it. We are encouraging people. We are almost forcing people by giving them land. Hey, go out in the middle of nowhere and start farming. 1862. 65 years later, they've been farming and farming. And industrializations allow them to farm more efficiently and farm more and overproduction and farming and farming and next thing you know, that too. The cows, right? The, the fact that the cows have now become, <laughs> but even the, the, the barbed wire and the fact that we've become a, more of a beef eating country, like all of that industrialization era stuff following the Homestead Act leads us directly to the Dust Bowl. Now, Black Sunday is April 14th of 1935. Over, th yes, <laughs> 300 million tons of soil. 300 million tons of soil are dispersed across the United States. So, of course, as people leave, leaving Oklahoma, for example, they're called the Okies, one of the biggest internal migrations in American history. They just read anything by Steinbeck of Mice and Men, particularly. Those are examples of Okies. Uh, George? <laughs> My boy Lenny from last year. George. I called this guy Lenny for the whole year after I got sent. He and uh, Devin, Derek, Dylan. Uh, but we also see uh, some significant Mexican repatriation or, or the sending back to Mexico of Mexican farm workers because nobody has any access to resources and Mexicans become an easy scapegoat. So the Dust Bowl, uh, I was sitting in a history class at this school my first year, and I heard a teacher uh, say that the Dust Bowl is one of the causes of the Great Depression. And I was like, Miss <laughs> 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 Newman. <laughs> no, no, she isn't. I think she's probably still a sophomore in high school when I started here. Um, but this, the Dust Bowl just makes the Great Depression worse. When it rains, it pours. Although you, we wished. So, so I think some stunning pictures. Uh, it's important to understand the effects being the Okies. That's a big effect. Or internal migration being a, a significant effect. So in 1932, as you guys know, Republicans nominate Hoover. And Democrats nominate Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, for the election in 1932. And the Democrats, they, they put together a very, very vague platform. Now, every presidential election, the Democrats put their platform out, what they stand for. Republicans do the same thing. And in 1932, it's important you guys understand the Democrats' platform is very vague. They don't have specific acts of what they're going to do. What they do say for the first time, big shift, is that the government should be responsible for human welfare. The government should step in and guarantee access to progress because business is not doing it, charity is not doing it, church is not doing it, and the government should do it. The one thing the Democrats are very specific on, though, is a, it's called a wet platform. What's the opposite of wet? Dry. So they, they want, the one thing they promise to do is get rid of prohibition. So if we've got to be broke, we might as well be drunk at the same time. Go Democrats. Uh, FDR promises bold action, but it doesn't say what that action is. He promises a new deal with the American people, but it doesn't say what's in that new deal. He just says that we're going to fix this together, we're going to do it, we just don't quite know how yet. As you guys know, I showed you this on Thursday of last week. Uh, FDR wins significantly, and Hoover goes home. 
Or his dog doesn't like him, that's what he says. To who will? And this leads us into our fifth party system. Sorry. Our fifth party system is pretty significant. You got one answer. For the first time from your reading, who's the, the, the voter block that joins the Democrats? No. African Americans. For the first time, we see black people leaving the Republican Party in large numbers and voting Democrat. Now, for the last 70 years, not 70 years, 40, 60 some years, 67 years, over a half century, the Republicans have, have kept the black vote by being the party of Reconstruction, the party of emancipation. And now, as Republicans become more and more and more and more the party of conservatives, pro business, anti tax, anti social progress, anti equal rights, um, Black people leave the party that ended slavery and become Democrats, and the Democratic Party increasingly and increasingly and increasingly adopts a platform of social democracy, of equality, of using the government to push for progress. So a lot of these things are the same, right? How long has the Republican Party been the party of business? Forever. Yeah, since its, since its beginning. Right? It's always been the party of, of the Northeast, parts in the, in, the, in the Midwest, but some big changes for Democrats is the addition of blacks to their, their voting block, their base, and the addition of progressive intellectuals, these idea people that are looking for progress and change. Right? I told you during the progressive era that progressives were both Republican and Democrat. It's this new deal, it's called the New Deal or the FDR Coalition, it becomes the fifth party system, in which Democrats represent the progressive mindset, the active government mindset, the black vote, etc. And the, this Democratic coalition is going to hold the presidency for the, the bigger part of the next 36 years uh, with, with a slight uh, Republican assent in the 1950s. Uh, and the Democrats are going to hold Congress for the next 36 years as well. So this group that makes it the Democratic Party has enormous political influence in American history for the next uh, 36 years. So FDR takes office in 1933, and he approaches this, this first 100 days idea. Now, the country is literally on the brink of collapse. A quarter of the country is unemployed. 38 states have complete bank failure. No working banking system in 38 of the states. An FDR request of Congress to just shut up and get along for the ride. Congress is also Democrat. Uh, and this is what we consider a quote unquote honeymoon period. Right, when everything is going to be super good, they're going to work together really well. Congress and the presidency is going to get after it and get as much stuff done as possible because they're both on the same page. But what he asks for is pretty, is pretty important. He asks for broad executive power. Broad executive power that would be given to me if we were, in fact, invaded by a foreign foe. When does the president have the most power in American history? During war. During war. So what he's asking of Congress is like, hey, you need to just start rubber stamping and approving everything I propose. Because it's, it's an emergency as if we're invaded without actually being invaded. And Congress gets along for the ride. They say, sure. What the hell else are we going to do? So we create a bunch, as you guys know from the video and you're reading, a bunch of, of quick programs. The Works Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Banking Holiday, America in the next 100 days or three plus months, really starts to recreate what it means to be an American. More examples? With the goal of his entire first 100-day program to be uh, under three umbrellas of relief, recovery, and reform. Now, which of these three do you guys think is the easiest? Reform. What do you guys think? Take a minute to talk to your partner. Which of these three is the easiest to do for our economy and why? Go for it. All right. Let's think about this. If I give you and you and you and you a job chopping down trees, which of these three have I addressed? Relief. Relief. I've given them a job. Have I fixed the economy? 
Is the economy functioning by itself without government handing out jobs? No. no. If I stop paying them, do they have a job? No. no. Have I fixed the economic system so this problem doesn't happen again? No. No. So which of the, these three is the easiest to do in the short term? Relief. Relief. If the government starts hiring people, that gives them relief. Immediate action to halt the economy's deterioration. I give him a job, I give him a job, I give her a job, I have provided relief. The thing to ask yourself is if the government takes a step back and stops paying these people, does the economy still keep functioning as if I was not paying them? No. Think of relief like training wheels. How do training wheels work? Luis still uses them. <laughs> How do train? There's no support, so you don't fall off. And what happens if you take the training wheels off? It depends. It depends. This is the training wheels. This is taking the training wheels off, hopefully. That if I give people jobs, the economy can run itself with government help long enough that eventually the training wheels come off and they can keep running itself. We'll talk about this on Thursday. When I show you, Roosevelt takes the training wheels off and the economy collapses again. It's called the Roosevelt Recession of 37 and 38. As we think, all right, we're good. People have enough jobs. Let's stop hiring people for the government. And then the economy just tails. So relief is pretty specific. Give people jobs so that they have some money in their hands and, 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 and food in the fridge and they, they can survive. Recovery involves investing in industrial recovery programs so that businesses can eventually hire their own workers and the government doesn't have to. Arguably the most important though is reform. Let's fix the system. They gave us overinflation, overproduction, and they gave us collapse. If we fix the system, we won't have to be back in this scenario in a couple of years. And then the government can get their hands off and people can just go about their business. So as we talked about in the video, the first thing he does is declare a four-day bank holiday. Every bank in America gets shut down. It's called the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. And then, with that $2 billion in cash, he's going to send money to banks that are sound, banks that are stable, banks that have a strong foundation. And then those banks and those banks only can go about their banking business. This first part is important, but I think the second piece of it is just as important. Congress also passes the Glass-Steagall Act. Monumentally important. Because what the Glass-Steagall Act does is it creates the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. If you go to a bank today, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase, whatever bank it is that you have around where you are, there will be a sticker in the window and it says FDIC uh, approved. And that means your money in that bank is safe. The Glass-Steagall Act creates the FDIC, which guarantees that if you or you or you put your money in the bank and that bank fails, which obviously happened to a lot of banks, if that bank fails, the federal government will give you your money back because that money is insured. Huge change in the role of the federal government. At the time, it guarantees your money up to $5,000. So if you put your, your if you put ten thousand bucks in the bank and the bank failed, you got five thousand bucks back. Pretty good deal. Together, what does this create though? The T word I'm looking for. Trust. That Americans know I can put my money back in the bank, and if I lose it, if the bank goes under, goes bankrupt, I'll get my money back still. It's very important this happens first. Now, banks aren't nationalized like some people want. Charles Coffey is one of them. Uh, but they are reformed. They are changed pretty significantly. In today, today's money, the FDIC insures your deposits up to $100,000. So say I had $107,000 in Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo collapsed. I get hundred grand back. Not from Wells Fargo, from the federal government. Big deal. Well, let's see. Does it work? This is the number of banks that fail every year, from 1921 to 1950. You guys be the judge. Does the Glass-Steagall Act and the Emergency Banking Act work? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. 
As we can see, bank failures are kind of high in the 20s as is. We should have been on a little red flag here. And they skyrocket in 1933 that we have over 4,000 bank failures just that year. And we've never had a spike again. You can make an argument that it was FDR's work and Congress's approval that saved capitalism in these eight days. These first eight days of his presidency, in which it looks like capitalism as a system is going to fail entirely, because with no, with no banking, there's no investment. With no investment, there's no business. With no business, there's no capitalism. Capitalism is saved. Also done in the first 100 days is the National Industrial Recovery Act. To try to get our economy back and running on its own. What it does, though, is it creates the National Recovery Administration, which is going to set maximum hours, set minimum wages for the first time, help workers. It's going to stimulate industry by fixing prices and setting production limits so that you can only produce so much and you have to pay your workers the same. This is actually going to be found unconstitutional in a couple years, well, not on Thursday. FDR is going to be pissed, whereas the Supreme Court is going to say you can't do that. You can't tell a business how much they can and can't produce. Question for you guys, what was one of the biggest causes of the Great Depression? Overproduction. And here we are trying to solve that problem, but we can't because it's unconstitutional to tell business what they can and can't produce. Yes, Charlotte? Is this um, taking care of farms? Nah, kind of. We'll talk about some more specific reform stuff. So later. What's that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's reforming the system in terms of like labor. But keeping in mind that reform is a broad term, relief, recovery from all kinds of failures. The public, you guys read about this already, public works administration to build public roads, bridges, and buildings. Uh, but also done quickly, first hundred days, is taking the U.S. off the gold standard. Why would we need to take the U.S. off the gold standard? What did he do that required him immediately taking us off the gold standard? Here's the video. Yeah. He supplied two billion bucks in money to the banks. That money wasn't backed by gold. We didn't have two billion bucks just sitting around in gold. So that immediate action shows that we're off the gold standard and we're trying to put uh, money back in circulation. Also, uh, the 21st Amendment is ratified very quickly, which gets rid of prohibition. Also in the first 100 days, a bunch of other important stuff. Uh, FARA, Federal Emergency Relief Act, Gives a bunch of money to soup kitchens and charities so they can go about feeding people. Kind of what uh, Hoover wanted, but now it's the federal government paying for it, not just charities doing it on their own. What are you talking about the CCC? Uh, also supported is the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Also found unconstitutional. Because it was paying farmers not to farm stuff. Why would we want to pay farmers not to farm stuff? Overproduce. Overproduction, right? By saying, we'll, we'll let a quota, we will pay you more money to not grow extra stuff. Because Americans are stupid, right? Industry wants to overproduce, farms want to overproduce. Um, and then, as mentioned in the video, the Tennessee Valley Authority is also super cool. We'll talk about that in a second as well. Hey, what happens to dust? What's dust for? It eventually settled, my man. And what do we do now? We still own a farm. It could happen again. Get, get all the hoses out there. <laughs> now, one of the, I think the most important pieces is the Tennessee Valley Authority. The Tennessee Valley Authority is, it puts thousands of people to work. Where? In the Tennessee Valley. And what they're doing is, is very straightforward. They're just building dams. And what can you get out of dams, though? Power. Electricity, power, right? So here's this area in the Tennessee Valley, the Tennessee River, that floods every year. It's a whole bunch of rivers. It looks like this. There's a bunch of rivers in the Tennessee Valley. They're going to build dams on each of them to A, stop flooding. That's cool. B, create electricity. That's cool. And C, that the government can sell that electricity to customers at a very low rate. An area in rural America that was still very non-industrialized, non-electricized. What's the downside to any of this? Risk of losing life. What? Risk of losing Sure, that's not a downside, though. It's just lives. Oh. <laughs> What's the societal downside to creating dams, having electricity, and selling electricity? Cost. Hmm. Nobody's paying for it. The government's just paying people to do it, man. <laughs> What's up? It could be used on the Constitution. Eh, maybe. Maybe. Uh, the big, there's some pictures of the dams. 
Big ass dams. Dams. Uh, critics claim that the Tennessee Valley Authority is too socialistic by having the government be the provider of the resource. And it said that this Tennessee Valley Authority was selling electricity for too cheap, so then other small businesses couldn't keep up. So in a sense, it was a government-owned monopoly, which it was, but, you know, the Great Depression. Also worth crediting is the Security Exchange Commission. This is a huge example of reform, a huge example. Uh, the Security and Exchange Commission is still alive and well today, and it's them that regulates the stock market, that regulates our financial markets, uh, that ensures that your banks, for example, don't go investing your money in high-risk things like the stock market, uh, to try to reform our, our investment system so people don't get too much in, uh, in over their head investment-wise and then have a situation in which the stock market crash kills the entire economy. It's the Securities and Exchange Commission which creates the system which you cannot buy stocks on margin. So that's one of the reasons we got in place in the first place. Like the ad pictures? Cool. So take a look at this cartoon. It's a good one. Take 30 seconds. Talk to your partner. Uh, what message is this cartoon trying to get at in terms of FDR and the way he runs the country? Talk to your partner. What you got? Talk to me. Yeah, he's according to this cartoon, he's played his cards right. Everything he's done is good to go. We're in good shape. Okay, especially because what would Hoover have done? Not played the game at all. Uh, his his uh, guy runs against him at 36 says, even the hand of an iron dictator is in preference to a paralytic stroke. Right, at least he's doing something. Uh, Will Rogers, famous comedian, uh, actor and musician at the time, says the whole country is with him, just so he does something. If he burned down the Capitol, we would cheer and say, well, at least we got a fire started anyhow. <laughs> so public opinion is strongly on, on the side of FDR and his work. Uh, also important is the, this role and, and authority of labor unions. The Wagner Act is passed in 1935 which is considered the Magna Carta, or the founding document that gives labor unions the power that they have. And it, it regulates unions. It gives unions the right and the authority to negotiate. Any business worker class can form a union if the majority of, of workers in a specific workplace vote to do so. It sets minimum wages. The Fair Labor Standards Act is a follow-up to the Wagner Act, also important. Uh, first nationwide minimum wage. Any guesses on how much? $2. 40 cents an hour. And maximum hour loss. So labor gets some, some good progress during the Great Depression, some very good progress during the Great Depression, uh, as the Wagner Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act make it easier and more powerful to be in a labor union. There, there are, however, as noted in the, in the video, uh, some challenges to FDR. Now, what I want you to understand is that his liberal critiques, like I told you in the video, say he hasn't done enough. Uh, Charles Coughlin wants to nationalize the bank, or have the federal government take over all banking. Townshend wants to give old people a monthly payment, which we're going to do on Thursday. We're talking about the Social Security Act. Huey Long, we talked about, is the Share the Wealth Program. These liberal critiques of his are saying he's not doing enough. But conservatives, largely uh, uh, pushed by big business, are going to argue he has done too much. He's gone too far. He's been too aggressive with the use of the government. The American Liberty League is a great example of big business owners who think he's gotten too involved in business, too regulatory, uh, too pro-union, too pro-worker, and that's worrisome. So if you turn your page, you have a cartoon. I'm going to give you just one minute because the bell's going to ring shortly. And this says New Deal labor policy, and all these guys are hiding behind a mask. Talk to your partner for just 30 seconds. How does this cartoon represent the conservative critique of New Deal, pol New Deal policy? One minute, go for it. How does this represent the conservative critique of New Deal labor policy? 
Thank you. I'm walking out. <laughs> Ten seconds. That's probably the most important chapter of the second semester. Last one? Yeah. 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 All right. So how is this, Brett? Brett, how is this uh, cartoon demonstrate the conservative critique of FDR's New Deal policy? Who's that? Okay. Is that what it is? That's what you're talking about, guys? Brendan, talk to us. What do you think? What is it? How is this? Uh, demonstrate the critique of his policy. Jeremy, I heard you make a good point. Take it away. How does this cartoon demonstrate the critique of his policies, conservative-wise? Um, I said that like, he was a cheat because the conservatives were used to having like a lot of growth and power uh -huh. um, at their disposal, but under the new deal labor policies, um, they would give um, the labor unions more power, and so they started to really paint the um, FDR like his supporters as like communists. Yeah. Uh, Good. That that uh, what what's hiding behind new deal labor policy and helping labor unions is in fact communism, collectivism. Utopian dreams and the redistribution of wealth. That we'll start with letting labor unions have a little more power, and then eventually it'll be communism. It's always the fear. Now, in 1936, FDR runs for re-election, and this is what it looks like. <laughs> Demonstrated that America is in fact behind his policies, and wants him to continue what he's doing in addressing the problems in America. Right? This one got eight electoral votes. 1.5 percent. Good work. Basically. In terms of, a, of another of a full nation, yes. All right, bell's going to ring any second, so please give me your 32 before you go. We'll continue with the legacies of the New Deal. Daniel, stop it.